presenters. Good afternoon. My name is Ola Jumoke Olasope, and it is my privilege and pleasure on behalf of Ijeshilad Foundation for Entrepreneurial and Leadership Development to welcome Mr. Adigwega Oyetola, the Executive Governor of Oshno State, Oba Dr. Gabriel Adekule Aromolano II, PhD CFR, the Owa Obokun Adimula of Ijeshiland, Paramount Ruler of Ijeshiland, Mr. Ayodeji Oni, FCA, Chairman of Our Maiden Lecture, Professor Folusho Okumadewa, Lecturer of Our Maiden Lecture, A Tree and a Forest, Development of Ijeshiland, Professor Iyola Oni, Moderator of Our Maiden Lecture, Titi Akinawa, Esquire, SAN, discussant at our maiden lecture. Engineer Didi Olu Falobi, discussant at our maiden lecture. Toyi Adeliji, Mrs. Bank of Industry, discussant at our maiden lecture. Engineer Joanna Maduka, MFR, our second lecture series was dedicated to her commitments to industry. Prince Clement Shui Hastrop, former Deputy Governor of Ocean State, was chairman of our second lecture series. Professor Shinyo Malamo was lecturer at our second lecture series, The Milk, the Honey, Collective Approach. Isaac Orolubagbe, FCA, discussant at our second lecture series. Ashiwaju Yinka Fashi, discussant at our second lecture series. Jumoke Lawoyi, mining consultant, discussant at our second lecture series. Professor Kola Kazim, Provost, Oshun State College of Education, moderator at our second lecture series. Distinguished guests, members of Ijeshelan Foundation, for entrepreneurial and leadership development, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to have you all here today. Thank you for joining. Our lecture today is the third edition of the Dr. Lawrence Omoli Annual Lecture Series in recognition of the pioneering effort at the industrialization of Ijeshe land, especially the establishment of International Bureau PLC. This year's lecture titled Entrepreneurship as a Tool for Community and National Development, which will be delivered by Mr. Olushegun Aganga CON, is dedicated to the leadership role and honor that he brings to Ijeshaland as a worthy son and leader of men worldwide. And I'm talking about Pastor Enoch Adijari Adiboye, General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God Worldwide. Today's lecture is being organized by Ijesha Land Foundation for Entrepreneurial and Leadership Development, short form IFILD. IFILD is a duly recognized not-for-profit community organization set up to be the catalyst for renewed enterprise towards a national industrial energization, particularly in Ijesha Land, Ocean State of Nigeria. They aim to develop a template from their activities that can model development in other homogeneous communities in Nigeria through a systematic networked generation of community leaders for sustainable growth. Their vision for development is inspired by the legacy of the illustrious son of Ijeshe land, Dr. Lawrence Omoli of blessed memory, who was a foremost philanthropist and community development trailblazer and motivator. In addition to the capacity building annual lecture in his memory, activities to achieve their vision include research, mentoring, networking, training, and other value added solutions. And now for some housekeeping guidelines. Please note this event is being recorded. As this is a virtual event, it will be nice to identify all attendees. Can I politely ask us to please populate our names if we have not done so already? To do this, there are two ways. 
You can click on the participants. Your name would be at the top of your device. And there are two options. When you hover the cursor over your name, you would see the option for more. Click on more and the option for rename will show. When you click on rename, you can then put your name in save and your name will be populated. The other option is to look at the screen, top right hand corner, there are three dots. If you click on the three dots, the same thing would show you have an option for rename. Click on the rename, put your name save and your name will be populated on the screen. The preferred option is for all attendees to please enable their videos. It would be nice to put a face to the name. Please stay muted at all times, unless you are asked otherwise. When it's time for the question and answer session, please use the raise your hand icon. And this can be found at the bottom of the participants list. When you are called upon, please unmute yourself, ask your question or questions. And when you are done, please mute yourself again. As this is a non-profit organization, all donations will be thankfully received. The bank details will be displayed on the screen from time to time. Lastly, let us all stay attentive to the speaker. You can make notes of your questions, which will be answered at the end of the lecture. And most importantly, let's get informed and acquire knowledge. But before we start in full swing, I'd like to call on Pastor Laiton Obileye to please lead us in the opening prayer. Pastor Laiton Obileye, please. Praise the Lord. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the grace that you have given unto us to be able to hold this year's told. Dr. Lawrence Omole lecture. We thank you for what you have done for us in the past. We thank you that even in the face of challenges, we are able to gather, albeit virtually, to celebrate the goodness of God in our land and also the ethos and values of Egyptian land. lands. We commit this lecture unto you, O Lord, and we pray that will take absolute control and there shall be positive impact on our land and there shall be great strides that shall visit our land and our community this lecture today we thank you for the lecturer and everyone who participate we pray in the name of jesus that your name shall be glorified in jesus name amen amen thank you sir and now I'd like to call on the chairman of the board of trustees for the foundation, Mr. Tony Ibarola. Please, your opening remarks, sir. Good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having to see my pleasure on behalf of the trustees of the Jaja Foundation for Entrepreneurial. To work, you know, Jesha uh, land proud all over the world. I'm talking about no other person other than a uh, pastor, Pastor E. A. Adeboye, the lecturer for today. This is Jesha land. Welcome you to the third series of our Dr. Lawrence Somali lecture series. The organization is, is registered as a non not for fit entity under the company and like C20 LFN 2004. The foundation was initially conceived as Dr. Lawrence Omole Center for Entrepreneurial and Leadership Development to further entrench the ideas of a renowned leader in the field of business, educational environment, philanthropy, and acknowledged community leader, the late pa Dr. Lawrence Somali, C.O.N., 1915 to 2008. His exemplary pioneering and sustained effort at the industrialization of Jesha land, especially the establishment of International Bureau, PSE, 
as established as the bedrock of recognition and acknowledged as a worthy foundation for emulation and leading light for the advancement of community development. I need to you know, state uh, for emphasis that the, this foundation was not conceived in any way to replace the uh, foundation that the family set up even after his demise, uh, demise to do to continue some of the things he was, he, was, he was known for while he was there. This foundation is not conceived or was not conceived to replace the family foundation. And it was not conceived to compete with, with nor any development activity or initiatives in our land. But we, were, we came out to be a part of you know, uh, what to, what to uh, be used to enhance uh, the development of Ijesha land. We are here to collaborate, to cooperate, to enhance, and to add value to every effort aimed at or directed at the development of the Jesha land. Wise continued to maintain its original concept, encompassing the commercial, educational, and industrial side of the honored icon as the core. The IFID was later expanded to cover the community broad socio political, science, and humanities facets. The foundation there, there, thereafter assumed the nomenclature to reflect this, but as the annual Dr. Lawrence Omoli lecture series as his flagship program and pedestal for other community development, developmental activities. We have and we continue to deliver on these valued mandates. Since our maiden lectures, a lot of initi in initiatives took off in the Jesha land, and we are proud to be truly the face of renewed effort at the transformation and justification of Ijesha land. Our vision. Fortune and our vision is, is clearly stated. It is to be the catalyst for renewed enterprise with the energization, especially in Ijesha land, community leader for value added leveraging on the wealth of experience and expertise available in society. The foundation will engage in research mentoring and in order to profile to use in spaces. I need to uh, introduce uh, my co uh, The board of, of, of IFID is on the board of currently the uh, chief of staff to the uh, uh, to the governor of Osho State. We have Alaji Latif Bakari, FCA, a renowned uh, you know chartered accountant of so many years. Mr. Sunday Akitoye Omole from Laiton Obileye, Professor Jide Oweye, the uh, the and the prince of of the of 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 land our activities the foundation organizes annual target seminar symposium training and other public engagement that will have positive impact on society we also give a current or postumum to men and women of Jesha origin in recognition of their commitment, effort, achievement, and contribution to the development of our land and the country. We hold the yearly lectures named the Dr. Lawrence Somali Memorial Lectures, lecture series. The lecture holds every October around, around the birthday of our, of our icon. That's uh, Dr. Lawrence Somali. The birthday is uh, 11th of October. So we, we try to situate our lectures within around his birthday to celebrate uh, this, this uh, icon of our land. Our 2018 maiden edition of the annual lecture series aired on 11th October 2018. It was titled A Tree and a Forest, Development of Ijesha Land. And it was under the chairmanship of Mr. Ayode Gioni, the former chairman of Access Bank and the past president of ICANN. The lead speaker at our 2018 lecture was Professor Folusha Okumadewa, who is a renowned you know, World Bank you know, economist. Uh, our 2019 lecture titled Ijesha Land, the Make the Honey, a Collective Approach, was delivered by Professor Sinyama Lomon, 
who is a renowned you know, uh, 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 geologist and uh, he, has, he has served in, on, on various committee, both uh, in Nigeria and even abroad on mining activities. Uh, he delivered the lecture and, and the lecture was actually was mainly centered around the, the mining industry and how to uh, what are the economic benefits, how to partake in the in the in the process. And mining being uh, a topic, you know, topic at that time in the land, we felt you know we needed to contribute to that. And that's why we brought an expert who is who is who is who is a known uh, worldwide to to lead the uh, 2019 you know, lecture. And the lecture was uh, was under the chairmanship of Prince Clement Adesuye Asro, the former deputy governor of Washington State. And the lecture took place at uh, the prestigious, you know, Sambi Hotel and Suit on the 10th of October. In addition, in 2019, a two day that is on the 9th and on the 10th of October 2019, a workshop was held for almost 200 youths on employability skill. And the uh, the, uh, the workshop, you know, for the youth was uh, was uh, uh, conducted by uh, a renowned uh, uh, consultant who came in from Lagos at that time, uh, Bereka Consulting, and the uh, the two-day workshop was held at uh, at the prestigious Sambit Hotel and Suite in Malaysia. Over 200, you know, youth, uh, you know, participated in this workshop. These are part of the uh, the things we uh, we we, amb we ambition that we continue to do to empower the youth to give uh, back to the society in, in whatever form that we felt was necessary. The 2019 lecture was dedicated to the surface service of engineer Joanna Maduka, MFR, a worthy daughter of Jesha Land and a leading engineer. This 2020 third annual Dr. Lawrence Omoli lecture is dedicated to Pastor Enoch Adejari Adeboye, the general overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God worldwide, for his outstanding leadership and role that is worthy of emulation and the honor he brings to Jesha Land as a worthy son and leader of men worldwide. The lecturer for this third annual, the lecturer for this third annual lecture is Olu, Mr. Olushe Mwaganga, who served Nigeria at various levels with distinction. At the appropriate time, a citation of our lecturer will be read before he delivers the lecture, entrepreneurship, a tool for community and national development. The pandemic notwithstanding, a revival is about to begin in Jesha, in Jesha land. And my prayer for, for all is to be a part of that revival. We shall all witness the revival, be a partaker of the revival, and benefit from the revival. Our lecturer, Mr. Olusha Gwaganga, is a revivalist and is a change agent. Our honoree this year, Pastor Yadeboye, is a revivalist, not only spiritually, but as an, as, as an embodiment of hope for now and the future. In this scarce space of integrity, that our land and nation crave more than ever as a fighter ingredient for development. Once again, I welcome you, I welcome you all and trust you will be truly blessed by today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, sir. And the next on the program, we have goodwill messages from the governor, um, the governor of, of the executive governor of Ocean State, Mr. Adigwega Oyutala, and his the uh, speech will be delivered on his behalf by the Deputy Governor of Ocean State, Mr. Adeguega Alabi. Can you please roll the tape? Thank you. To the glory of the Lord, we are today witnessing another annual lecture of the IDESA Entrepreneurship and Development Foundation, third edition of it. I recognize the former Governor of State of Ocean. Ogweni, Abrao, Arabiswala, and the closest son of this land. I recognize the former deputy governor of the state of Oshun, Prince Adisui Astro. Also recognize the former deputy governor of the state of Oshun, Yerilu Obada. I warmly welcome the former minister of trade and investment, Dr. Olushegun Aganga, who is the guest lecturer for today. I'm happy to recognize the awardees of today. Our real father, our primary ruler of Yisha land, Owa Ubukun of Yisha land, His Royal Majesty, Oba Adekone Gribel Arumalam, and our father and the Lord, and our day of today, 
also an industrial son of Indonesia land. Our papa, Pastor D.A. Adiboye, the general of our seers of the New Christian Church of God. I'm happy to appreciate and recognize the visionary of this noble cause, the Church Entrepreneurship and Development Foundation, for organizing this annual lecture. Their intention is very noble. It's part of things that we want our people to emulate so that we can turn our state to be at the southwest of Nigeria. Secret operatives, gentlemen of the press, distinguished guests from Panamia, ladies and gentlemen, address of His Excellency, the Governor of the State of Washington. Mr. Adiboyega Oyetola, at the top public lecture of the Ijeja Entrepreneurship and Development Foundation. I am delighted to join you, distinguished audience of Ijeja elders and leading professionals, at the third edition of Ijeja Entrepreneurship and Development Foundation public lecture. I congratulate our retired monarch, the Oval Boko of Ijeja land. Of our doctor, Adekoli Gregory Arbolaro, the honorary of today, and our illustrious religious leader, Pastor E. A. Adeboye, to whom this year's lecture has been dedicated, the guest speaker and former Minister of Trade and Investment, Dr. Urushego Aganga, and all esteemed members of the Foundation who have worked hard to make today possible and indeed for all their effort towards making the Indonesia land truly progressive and prosperous. I must thank the Indonesia Foundation for focusing on the important issue of entrepreneurship at this time, especially as a tool for mobilizing citizen participation in wealth creation. In many ways, the theme of this lecture resonates the core objective and commitment of our administration to revitalize the offshore economy through aggressive infrastructural development and promotion of key developmental plan, development plans be dedicated on critical area of agriculture, tourism and mining. I'm happy to say that Jesha Land is indeed Potentially positioned to lead this economic revolution. Out of the phenomenal entrepreneurship spirit imbued in the Jesha people that has made you world class entrepreneurs and innovators. I am expectant that through this lecture we will be enlightened and further challenged on the need to follow the full step of the enterprising exports of our four peers and rise as change agents in our quest for the transmission, transmissional development of our land. I thank you and wish you a most fruitful deliberation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And now the goodwill message from Pastor E.A. Adeboye, General Overseer, RCCG Worldwide. Please roll the tape. Thank you. Loved elders of Ijesha land, greetings to you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to thank God for your life. I want to thank God that you are following the footsteps mm -hmm. of your ancestors. I'm sure you know it's elders like you that brought about the establishment of Elisha Grammar School, my alma mater. I want to thank God that they started something that had produced great men and women all over the world. 
I want to thank God that you too, you have started something that I believe is going to bring a lot of blessings to several people throughout the whole world. Thank you very much. And thank you for honoring me by asking me to say a word of prayer for you and for Ejeshal Land as a whole. My prayer for you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ is that it will be well with you, that the desire of your hearts will be granted you, that the God I serve will take care of you, take care of your families, and take care of all those who are precious to you. My prayer for you is that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you will not fail, you will not fall, that you will never beg for bread. My prayer for you is that it will be well with you all the days of your life, that the almighty God will move you from glory to glory, from greatness to greatness. My prayer for you is that your evening will be far, far more glorious than your morning. My prayer for you is that your children will be greater than you, that every member of your family will be celebrated sooner or later. And my prayer for Ejisha land is that the glory of this great land will be fully restored, that the almighty God himself will look down with mercy on Ejisha land and prosper this kingdom far, far beyond our widest imaginations. My prayer is that every plant God has not planted in Ejesha land shall be rooted up. My prayer is that whatever prayers we we'll pray for Ejesha land, God will answer by fire. My prayer is that very soon the whole world will be hearing beautiful news of miracles, signs, and wonders concerning Ejesha land. And so shall it be. My prayer is that the Almighty God, who started revival in Ejesha land in the days of Babalola, that same God will start another great revival in Ejesha land so that very soon the whole land will be shouting, God is good, God is kind, and Jesus is Lord. So shall it be. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. And once again, thank you very much. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, sir. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, the lecture itself, I'd like to introduce to you. Mr. Shagel Aganga is a chartered accountant with professional career extending over four decades holding a number of leadership positions in private and public sector. His wealth of experience covers a broad range of sectors, including investment banking, investment advisory, traditional and alternative asset management, insurance, oil and gas, manufacturing services and construction. He is the chairman, Marina Express Train Services, 3V Partners, and he sits on a number of boards, including Lidway Pension PFA. He is also on the advisory board of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust in the United Kingdom. Mr. Aganga was previously a managing director of Goldman Sachs in London. And prior to that, he was a senior director at Ernst & Young, London, where he had various roles, including responsibility for some Japanese clients and the subject matter expert for hedge funds in Europe. Within the public sector, he served first as Nigeria's Minister of Finance and Chairman of the Economic Management Team, and then as its Minister of Industry, Trade and Investments. Mr. Aganga has been wildly acclaimed as being responsible for many transformational milestones in Nigeria, including establishing the country's sovereign wealth fund, issuing the nation's first euro bond, chairing the World Bank and IMF in 2010, 
chairing the eighth ministerial conference of the World Trade Organization, MC8, in Geneva in 2011. The first African to chair this organization, making Nigeria the premier destination for investments in Africa and launching the country's boldest industrialization agenda. He was also responsible for structuring and financing the first standard gauge rail in Nigeria. Mr. Aganga remains one of the most regarded investor influencers for Nigeria, based on his extensive experience both internationally and in Nigeria, and his track record in and out of government. In recognition of these contributions, he was awarded the commander of the Order of the Niger, CON, one of the highest ranking national honors by the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He founded the Nigerian Leadership Initiative, NLI, a platform for accomplished and credible Nigerians in the diaspora and in Nigeria to sharpen their values-based leadership skills and to play a role in transforming the country. Mr. Aganga is a chartered accountant with degrees from Oxford University and the University of Ibadan. He is married with four children. And now, uh, Mr. Olusegun Aganga, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The Chairman, Your Excellencies, Your Royal Highness, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, please permit me to adopt the protocol already established. I would like to thank the Jeshalan Foundation for Entrepreneurial and Leadership Development for inviting me to speak at this year's Dr. Lawrence Omoli's CON annual lecture. This particular lecture is dedicated to Pastor E. A. Adeboye, the General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of Nigeria worldwide. The invite brought back memories of my time at Christ School and the journey from Lagos to Adoikizi and back at the beginning and end of each term in the late 60s and early 70s. We would stop at a leisure to refuel, relax and eat. I remember that as we drove through Elisha in those days, it was difficult not to notice those big houses. At least that was what they looked like to us at the time. Those big houses of some of the most of some of the highly successful Egyptian entrepreneurs, like the Omoles, Ajanakus, Onis, and so forth. In a way, this motivated the younger generation to aspire and hope that one day they too could become as successful as some of these entrepreneurs. I also grew up in Bodilon Road, Ikui, Lagos. And most people who know Ikui very well would know that Bodilon Road is very close to Queen's Drive. Anytime I strolled down to Queen's Drive, it was impossible not to notice a very large, wide, imposing building known as Ijisha Lodge owned by Chief S.B. Bakari, another Egyptian successful entrepreneur. There are many, many more, but the message is clear that like most Nigerians, entrepreneurship is in the DNA of the average Egyptian man. That is one of the reasons the topic for today's lecture was chosen. Today, I intend to address four main areas. What is entrepreneurship? 
how and why it is a tool for development and the catalytic role you and foundations like the IFFEALD can play to achieve this development and social value to our communities. It was Lee Kuan Yew, the former prime minister of Singapore, who said that one of the reasons for his remarkable success in Singapore was that he was always, he would always put pragmatism before ideology or theory. In the same vein, I intend to be long on pragmatism, practical things, and very short on theory and on the academic side. It is about focusing on an outcome and taking concrete steps that will create and add value to our communities. So what is entrepreneurship? There are many definitions of entrepreneurship, but for the purpose of today's discussions, it is better understood by describing it in many ways. Generally, entrepreneurs are involved in four main businesses. Small businesses, scalable startups, large companies, and in social enterprises. Sometimes they are classified broadly as traditional and social entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurship is a new and growing phenomenon and will be relevant to our discussion today. I would therefore like to expand a little bit on social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship is at the most basic level doing business in a social cause or doing business for a social cause. It might also be referred as a altruistic entrepreneurship. They don't measure their success in terms of profit alone. Success to social entrepreneurs means that they have improved their communities and the world, however they define it. Social entrepreneurship focuses on gaining understanding of how a social problem develops in the communities and how an entrepreneur with the use of his innovative practical ideas and business strategies develops solutions to resolve the problem to the benefit of the society as a whole. Social entrepreneurs focus at utilizing the various available resources to create a better and progressive society. Making money is not enough for them. They need to add meaningful value to the world and to their communities. Many philanthropists and investors looking for economic and social return have raised a lot of funds globally to support social enterprise. The Queen's Common Commonwealth Trust is one of these organizations focused on funding, connecting, and supporting social entrepreneurs in the Commonwealth. I sit on the advisory board and I was so delighted to see that entrepreneurs in Nigeria, Ghana, Trinidad and Tobago, Mozambique, Uganda, Rwanda, Malawi, Tanzania, Kenya have benefited from the Queen's Commonwealth Trust. Both traditional and social entrepreneurs have a number of attributes in common, which some refer to their characteristics. They have passion for their venture, are hardworking and very flexible. They have the ability to spot opportunities and do something about those opportunities. What some may call the unique attribute to smell money from afar. They are like the Dangotes and the Boas of Nigeria. It is one thing to spot an, op an opportunity 
But what differentiates them is that they do not only spot the opportunities, but they do something about it. In a way, they are plotters, shapers, and implementers. They have a determination to succeed and are always optimistic. And like the average Geisha man and woman, they are not easily deterred by challenges and believe that they and they believe that they can they can and will always find a way. You definitely need this to succeed in Nigeria. They understand the use and the value of money and are self-motivated. They take calculated risk and are very good at solving problems. So why and how is it a tool for development at community and national levels? There's no doubt that where there's a pool of entrepreneurial individuals, there is a possibility of growth and community development. I will use Innocent and Inewi, a town in Anambra State, which I refer to as the industrial hub of Nigeria to illustrate some of the points I want to make. Innocent, as you know, produces vehicles that have a very high percentage of local content in Inewi. Around this factory are micro and small businesses owned by entrepreneurs who Innocent himself trained and funded to produce some of the parts needed for his own assembly plant. That singular strategy by Innocent, an entrepreneur, created several jobs in his community and improved the quality of life of the community. It is about training and plugging your entrepreneurs in the value chain of the many companies you have in Nigeria land, from the Segilola gold mining project to the breweries. We have another example by Indorama in Eleme. But I can assure you that Thor or Segilola can and will do far much more for the community if the community continues to provide the right business environment and protect their assets, and more international investors are likely to follow Thor once they see that they are successful. I cannot overemphasize the importance of small and scalable startup enterprises, also known as micro, small, and medium enterprises for community and national development. MSMEs are the bedrock for Nigeria's industrialization and inclusive economic development. All over the world, MSMEs are the primary drivers of employment. In China, MSMEs employ about 75% of the workforce in China. In the United Kingdom, it employs about 54% of the workforce. In the United States, about 55% of the workforce. And in Brazil, 70% of the workforce. It is therefore the MSMEs that will create enough jobs to meet our needs as a country. The last national survey conducted by the National Bureau of Statistics and SMEDAM in 2017 identified about 41.6 million MSMEs employing about 86.3% of our workforce in Nigeria. They accounted for 49.78% of our GDP and about 7.6% of our exports. So you can imagine if each MSME in Nigeria was able to employ just one extra person, we would create about 41 million extra jobs and unemployment in Nigeria will be reduced to a minimal number. To put the numbers into perspective, 41.6 million is higher than the population of 44 African countries. 
about 54% of MSMEs in Nigeria are in agribusiness, which means that they play a major role in providing food security and in poverty reduction. Higher earnings, of course, through entrepreneurship can help boost national income and tax revenue. They also contribute to community projects and support local charities. Both the traditional and social entrepreneurs deliver these benefits, but let's examine other benefits social entrepreneurs bring to the table. That's a growth area globally. Social entrepreneurs focus on developing an equal and just society by providing economic and social security to the members of the society, by providing them livelihood opportunities, and by raising the standard of living of the people. They act as, a role, as role models to motivate youth to initiate action to bring positive change into society. Social entrepreneurs develop businesses which address problems in communities such as poverty, unemployment, gender inequality, inadequate education and health facilities, hunger, and so on. I will mention some well-known and lesser known social entrepreneurs as example to bring the points home. Blake Makoski is the chief shoe giver and founder of a company called Tom's Shoes, a company he founded in 2006, investing about $300,000 of his own money. Tom's pledged to donate one pair of shoes for every one sold and has expanded the one for one campaign to support water site birth and other initiatives. Through Tom's brand, Mykoski has raised awareness about the issues like about issues like uh, poverty and health. As of 2019, the organization had provided people in developing countries with 95 million pairs of shoes and more than 722,000 weeks of safe water. Moreover, Tom's eyewear program has helped to restore sight in more than 780,000 individuals by giving recipients prescri prescriptive glasses or surgery. Another famous well-known social entrepreneur is Muhammad Yunus a professor renowned for the popularization of microfinance and microcredit. In 2006, Yunus was awarded the Nobel Prize for creating Grameen Bank, which is based on the principles of trust and solidarity to empower villagers with the funding to pull themselves out of poverty. According to Grameen Bank, as of February 2020, this year, 97% of its 9.31 million borrowers are women who pay their loans back at a recovery rate of 98%, a recovery rate that is higher, much, much better than any traditional banking system. This renowned professor has received international awards like the US Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Congressional Gold Medal in 2010. There is absolutely nothing stopping prominent Ejisha sons and daughters to set up a mini microcredit micro fund to support the poor, the women, to create sustainable businesses just imagine the impact this could have in the community. Another well-known social entrepreneur is Mark Koska, who redesigned medical tools and introducing a non-usable, reusable, inexpensive serine 
to be used in underfunded clinics. This innovation safeguards against the transmission of bloodborne diseases. Costco founded the Safe Point Trust in 2006, which delivered 4 billion safe injections in 40 countries where there is auto disabled syringes. And of course, we have the case of Joel McNamara, who founded a company when she was still in high school. Mainly, it's an e commerce business that creates jobs for African women by selling the products they make. Products range from jewelry to wooden kitchen utensils. Another lesser known and small company makes and sells t shirts with positive nonviolent non messages to the people in the community where there was need for values reorientation. There are some, these are some of the ways traditional and social entrepreneurs act as drivers of development in their communities and in their nation. But why is it so important that we act now? It is far more important now than ever before that we use entrepreneurship as a tool for community and national development due to a combination of factors. One is a high level of poverty in our country today. According to the 2019 Poverty an inequality report released by the National Bureau of Statistics recently, 82.9 million representing 40.1% of Nigerians are poor. The poverty war clock actually claims that the number of the absolute poor in Nigeria is closer to 105 million, which is about 51% of the population of our great country. There's a high level, there's also a high level of unemployment, which has been made worse by COVID-19. The high level of social unrest and insecurity. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, Nigeria is one of the countries that will be worst hit by food crisis, and we're already seeing the signs. According again to a survey released last week by the MDS, one in four households was already indebted prior to the pandemic, and the share of households and the share of households experiencing moderate or severe food insecurity remained high at 68% as of the end of August, 2020. And according to the World Bank, the collapse in the oil prices coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic is expected to plunge the Nigerian economy into a severe economic recession, the worst since the 1980s. The federal government of Nigeria is already taking steps to address some of these issues. And the different state governments are already taking steps to address some of these issues. Through the economic sustainability plan. And we're beginning to see some results. But we cannot leave it alone to the government. The easiest and the quickest way to address these issues in our nation today is to also start from our communities, what some would describe as a bottom-up strategy, from our community to the state and to the nation. Those are the reasons why it is so important that we act now. And what is the role for foundations like the Jisha Foundation for Entrepreneurial and Leadership Development. As an organization set up as a catalyst for growth and development, especially in Ijeshaland. 
First, let's remind ourselves of some of what we know about the Egyptians and, and Egyptian land. Egyptian land is one of the oldest settlements in, the, in Yoruba land. It is a deliberate center for the collection of cocoa for export and other food crops for domestic markets, which include palm oil, carnels, kolanot, maize, cotton, yams, cassava. Egyptian people are known to be traders, all types of commerce, especially textile, and are successful entrepreneurs as we have already identified. The people of Egyptian land by reputation are hospitable, honest, and not known to easily give up on what they believe in, a major trait of a successful entrepreneur. Egyptian land is a rainforest zone known for its agricultural potentials. Egyptian land is an agricultural, commercial, and processing land situated in a region in which we find all these crops. Egyptian people are generally, as we said, entrepreneurial by orientation and can use this unique strength to drive community development. Today, in many parts of our country, we face a breakdown of community. Whilst entrepreneurship is certainly not a panacea, I am convinced more than ever before that it is an effective and proven way to contribute to the hopeful and renewing process of building our communities. There are many ways the communities and local foundations can support entrepreneurs to make a huge difference in their communities. I will highlight four areas today. One is by encouraging talent. Communities and community foundations like yours can support training and education initiatives for entrepreneurs by, for example, developing a community-based entrepreneurship curriculum and economic plan. For maximum effect, I would always advocate that the curriculum should incorporate traditional values with the principles and practices of entrepreneurship. The values that will also make the entrepreneur and Omoluabi. With your permission, I would like to expand on the tailored training required and this concept of Omoluabi. To excel and make a huge difference in our communities and in our nation, it is important that these entrepreneurs are not only trained to acquire relevant skills and business knowledge, but that they are also trained on values-based leadership. For those who may not be familiar with the concept of Omoluabi in the Yoruba culture, an Omoluabi is a person of honor who believes in hard work, respects the rights of others, and gives to the community in deeds and in action. Above all, an Omoluabi is a person of integrity. The concept of Omoluabi is an adjectival Yoruba phrase, which has the word Omo Ti Oluiwa B as its components literally translated and separately. Of course, you know, Omo means child, T means that or which. Oluiwa means the chief or master of Iwa character. B, of course, means burn. When combined, Omoluabi translates as the baby begotten by the chief of Iwa. Such a child is thought of as a paragon of excellence in character. The most fundamental of these principles of values 
demonstrated by an Omoluabi a Orosiso Dodomire spoken word. The Yoruba accord great respect for intelligent and expert use of language. The second value is Iteriba, which is respect. The third is Inurere, goodwill, having a good mind towards others. And the third is Otito, Domimi, which is truth. The next is Iwa, character. The another is Akin Konju, which is bravery. The another is Ishe, hard work, and Opolo, intelligence. In short, what I am emphasizing is that values matter to get the best out of these entrepreneurs and you should incorporate it in your training program. I remember when I was a Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, and we wanted to train some youths and provide them with funds to start their businesses. The Minister of Youth then was completely against the approach because of the experience they had on a similar program in the ministry. Some of the youths they trained and provided money to to start their businesses, just took the money, never bought the tools or started any business. Some said they preferred selling scratch cards or going to politics to starting or running a sustainable business. And when equipment was given to them instead of money, some simply sold the equipment and did nothing. Very few had the discipline and the intention to pay the money back. We have a greater chance of bringing our values back and training entrepreneurs at the community level as our fathers, our grandfathers did in the 60s, in the 70s and the early 80s. The second area of intervention is by expanding opportunity. There are many opportunities in Nigeria land already. This is about helping to expand the opportunities and where possible to help de-risk them. This could involve creating a climate for entrepreneurs to build enterprises, such as an industrial park where common facilities like electricity can be shared. Many researches have shown that Egyptian land is very fertile, good for agriculture and rich in solid minerals, including having the largest deposits, the largest gold deposits in Nigeria. Gold is Egyptian's oil. Gold is Egyptian's oil. This presents a lot of opportunities, better than many countries in Africa today. Entre entrepreneurs can, for example, go into the areas of artisanal mining, working with the Ministry of Mines, the Solid Minerals Development Fund, and SMEDA. They can go into food and cash, and cash crops farming. The very fertile lands encourages enterprise. Cocoa processing is not enough to just produce cocoa and export them to Netherlands, and sometimes they reject them. We can process, we should process. Almost 80% of the cocoa production in the world comes from West Africa. And yet, most of the processing and sale, the value addition and the money is made in the Western world. I did congratulate the governor of uh, Cross River State for setting up his cocoa processing factory. There's nothing 
Elisha is home to Kopo. There's no reason why Elisha should not think beyond that and look at the value addition and start a cocoa processing plant. Gary production from cassava is readily available and the market is also huge. Adire production, the heavy traffic of tourists, most especially during the Oshun festival and the skill set encourages this. Ashoke enterprise. This is an enterprise line with strong tie to the Yoruba culture and race. And if well marketed and done, can generate foreign currency. You can start this business with very little capital and turn it into a sustainable commercial enterprise within a short period of time. There are other areas like food processing, automotive repairs, mobile phone repairs, transport business that geishas are well known for. You can also get involved in the one local government, one product initiative of SMIDAM. I'm not sure whether you're aware of this program, but it is about producing one product in each of your local governments that can be sold locally and or exported. SMIDAM's all up mapping for Elisha already identifies opportunities in the different local governments. And I'm sure they will be delighted to work with you and your entrepreneurs to make this a reality. I'm aware that the Ijecha Mineral Resources Development Forum has done extensive work in the area of solid minerals and have identified the opportunities in Ijecha land. In particular, how you can plug into the value chain for the Segilola Gold Project in Ikpinido. So I will not discuss this in detail here today. I would, however, encourage those who are interested to link up with SMIDA and work closely with them. The third area of intervention is by providing the know-how. Every entrepreneur must develop an, uh, an, an or acquire technical know-how in addition to the personal business skills they already have to run their businesses. This could involve linking local businesses to government and their agencies like SMIDAM, ITF, FIRO, raw materials, linking businesses to technology and academia to support and advance entrepreneurship. These agencies conduct educational programs, set up networks of entrepreneurs, provide access to professional expertise and facilitate access to capital for entrepreneurs in their communities. The final area of potential intervention is by increasing capital. As some of you already know, capital may be the most elusive factor in the entrepreneurial process. We already know that the lack of access to finance was the biggest challenge to 90% of the entrepreneurs who responded to the survey by the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics and SMIDA. Research have also shown that a startup most rely on personal savings, family and friends who may become former friends if the business fails. When the business looks viable, most entrepreneurs approach banks, microfinance institutions, solid mirrors development funds, DFIs like Bank of Industry, or access community seed funds where they are available. And when it shows signs of growth, the entrepreneur approaches private capital for investment. Communities and local foundations can support entrepreneurs with their own capital food chains and thus increase the amount of capital available to them while facilitating access to other sources of capital. This is where I now want to throw a challenge to all of us. Finance has been identified as the biggest constraints and you 
can do something about it. There are many prominent Ijesha sons and daughters at home and abroad. Let us today resolve to play a part in resolving part of this problem for the traditional and social entrepreneurs in Ijesha land so that they can become effective tools for development. Let us resolve to create a minimum, a minimum of 100 million seed fund for Ijesha entrepreneurs. And it's not too difficult to do. All we need to do is to ask, is to appeal to a hundred prominent Ijisha sons and, daughter, and daughters to contribute a minimum of just 1 million within the next three months into a seeding fund. I think so, we can do that right now. I think we should launch that. Which you run, okay. Um, terrific. I was just going to say, I was just looking at the participants list and I see that it, uh, you have about 137 people on this program. If only half today pledge that, I undertake to make my own contribution. I will set the ball rolling as I speak as a lecturer of today and a friend of Ajisha's. I will make my 1 million available today. So given that you have given me the permission and you have said you're willing, it is my privilege and honor to launch this seed fund for Ajisha's entrepreneur on today, on uh, this day, a very special day, and it, which is special dates of 10, 10, 2020. I think we all have the privilege and opportunity to make history and set the pace for other Nigerian communities. Please feel free to use the chat facility on Zoom to register your interest to join the 100 million club. The target is to raise 100 million minimum within the next three months. If half of us on this program pledge to make that donation, we would have raised at least 70 or 80 million today. In conclusion, your excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to restate my submission that Ijeshas are entrepreneurs by nature. It is in their DNA and Ijesha land itself flows with milk and honey. I have been to so many parts of the country and I can tell you that from what I have seen and know about Ijesha land, Ijesha land is with really privilege. Ijesha land flows with milk and honey. With the number and quality of the solid minerals found in Ijesha. In fact, Nigeria's first industrial gold project by Thor or Segelola is here, is in Ijesha land. That mine is on course to enter production by the end of March next year. When it does that, it will be it will be a game changer, not only for Ijesha land, but a game changer for the whole of our country, Nigeria. We also have an arable land where almost everything or anything can grow. Now is the time for foundations like the Ijesha, like, like the um, Ijesha. Foundation for Entrepreneurial and Leadership Development to take the lead and act as catalyst for making entrepreneurship an effective tool for development in Nigeria land, Oshun State, the Southwest, and indeed in our great country, Nigeria. There's no better time than now. The time to act is now. Let me close 
my address by highlighting the importance of legacy at this point in the Egyptian story. All great countries and communities are built on the continued improvements from generation to the, to the next. This is a philosophy I believe in strongly. You now have the button let's take the necessary action that we ensure that our generation leave behind a stronger and better Egyptian community. Let us build a legacy that lives far beyond us all. Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, Royal Highnesses, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for listening. Ima Shenwo, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That was a fantastic lecture. We have all been educated. We've been given information. Awareness has been created. We have been challenged and encouraged. And today, it's been launched, the Industrial Trust Fund. And I'm glad to announce that we already have people making pledges, but we can do better. And please, I want to encourage everybody on here, every little bit helps. Don't think that, oh, you haven't got a million. It doesn't have to be a million. It could be a million, it could be more, it could be less, but little drops of water make a mighty ocean. Please, can I have the bank details shown on the screen for people to take down the details for those who are making pledges so that they can make their payments? Thank you. You can use your phone and take a picture of this or you can write it down. We'll also put this in the chats for you to pick up while we're taking questions and answers, which is what we're going to be doing very soon. But please take down the details now the bank details so that you can make payments as and when you can within the next three months is what we've been challenged to do. And at this point in time, I would like to take questions for Mr. Olusegun Aganga from the floor. So if you have any question or questions, um, please raise your hand in the chat, I mean, in the participants, raise your hand there and then I would call on you. So anybody with any questions, please. You can raise your hand in the participants. Um, somebody is asking, sir, for a copy of the lecture paper for use and reviews. Is that something that you can facilitate, sir? Uh, yes, please. I'll make that available. Thank you, sir. Through, through the foundation. Okay, sir. Um, okay. Okay, there, there's a suggestion about... Okay. Any questions from the floor, please? Any questions from the floor? May, may I also suggest that we, you've given us the details, the bank account details. May I suggest that since we say within three months, by the end of January, uh, that the foundation will come back to everyone on this platform and let us know whether we have met our target or not. So that we get an update from them. Okay. Um, there is a suggestion in the chat um, saying, I suggest that an alternative fundraising window for debt is also created. Please don't restrict fundraising to grant a loan. Um, I'm sure that's not what you're saying, sir. <laughs> uh, that's not what I'm saying. Um, you, the, the, the investment, an investment fund where there are three ways you can go about it. It can be grant, it can be investment, um, and it can be investment with a little bit of grant to support. Um, I find that where there's a level of investment tied to it, we have more commitment from everybody and it's done in a far more disciplined way. I'm always focused on outcome, delivery. 
And I think you will, if it's, an, it's treated as an investment, I think you will see the outcome very quickly. Thank you, sir. The same person is actually saying, is this a donation or a seed equity? Now, is it a donation? No, it is a, that's the question we've just answered now. So if, should you decide in your wisdom and say, well, we just want to make a grant, then it becomes a donation. However, the intention is if it's a seed investment, then it's an investment which you expect to have return on your investment. You expect to see social and economic return on investment and it's properly managed uh, to make sure that you get that return. Thank you, sir. I've got a hand, uh, Eniola Ariel Show. I'm going to unmute you now so that you can ask your question. Eniola Ariel Show. Thank you very much, Ma. I, I really want to comment and appreciate our honorable minister for the lecture that I presented today. It was an eye opener for me and a lot of things were mentioned, and I've had a lot of knowledge. The, my question, sir, so I really appreciate you for the presentation, sir. My question is. Why is the recovery rate? I think we might have lost him there. That people feel bad. So that is the encourage to put him on money. Where can me? Sir, can you can you can you Repeat your question. We got cut off in between. Can you start again? Well, I'm asking why is the recovery rate of SME loans in Nigeria very low? And what can we do about this so that other people, philanthropists, can be encouraged to put more money down and also make finance banks and give people money freely? How can we improve on the recovery rate of loans to SMEs in the country? Thank you, sir. Well, um, now there are there are many ways you can improve on the recovery rates. So if you took Eunice for example, he you, he was focused on women; they were cooperatives, and each person had had uh, um, held each other accountable. Now there are many ways you can you can improve on this. One, first of all, is to do your analysis properly before making the loans, and making sure that. You are not investing only in the business, you are investing in the people running the business, which is why I was emphasizing the importance of values, discipline. And, and you know, so you must make sure that they have that. Uh, so you're investing in people and also in the business. That's very important. Uh, the second thing is that you must have a good monitoring process in place. I think if, if you, your analysis is right in, in terms of assessing the business, the individual, you're investing in both of them. Your chances of, if it's possible, if you have cooperatives, you can make them to cross guarantee each other. That way the community holds them accountable also. So there are many ways you can improve the um, recovery rate. Thank you. Um, it says here, will the recording be sent to participants actually I think that you can get that through the uh, foundation um, because the foundation has the rights to this recording. The next one here is SME recovery rates in Nigeria. How can this be improved? S SME credit rating, is that a question? SME recovery rates in yeah. Nigeria. That's what we just discussed now. Yeah. So I think people are just repeating the same question. Yeah, in different the same question. That's, that's what we just discussed now. Yeah. Any more questions from the floor? Let's seize this opportunity that we have, Mr. Olusha Daganga, and um, you know, make use of his expertise. Any more questions? Okay. Um, and this is uh, a thanks. We have Ms. Thanks very much for such an informative session. Can you please provide more information regarding the one local government, one initiative, sir? Uh, I, it was, I think it's, um, I think Smidam, so it was done in, uh, I think in China and I think also in India. Um, and you also have one state, one product. 
Um, and it is part of the NEDEP program, which government uh, uh, advertised and talked about in 2015. Basically, what SMIDAM have done, you see, we, we have some very effective agencies of government who are there to support and assist as much as possible, and they've done a lot of work. The problem is that most Nigerians do not know enough about these agencies, and there's little interaction. Uh, one of the things which we can do is that if you get them together, I can help make an introduction and make sure that Smedan comes to see them and train them and talk to them. They are willing, that's what they are set up to do. And they're willing and, and happy to do this. But what they have done as a way of promoting entrepreneurship is to look at each local government and say, what do they have that can be produced in commercial quantity and which can lead to having a sustainable business? And they've identified all over the country and identified what is good, what you can do in different areas, uh, working with raw materials as well. Uh, the next thing, um, I, I think at the time, there was a time they were trying to set up cooperatives in all these local governments so that you have five or six people uh, doing the same thing. Uh, they, they were doing that because they felt that we improved the, the recovery rate and make it easier for uh, communities to hold each other accountable for what they needed to do and all that. The problem has been funded. The training, the products have been identified. Smedam have the ability to train, but they don't have the funds to set them up. Uh, and this is why, why capital is so important. Um, uh, where the capital is available, it's a lot easier to do. But what I can do is facilitate uh, a, a, a lecture or, or a conference or whatever, a seminar where SMIDAM can come and meet with those entrepreneurs and talk to them and they can get whatever questions, uh, the answers to whatever questions they have. Um, if, they, if you need more information about the OLOP, then I can also obtain that and uh, maybe through the foundation, make it available to people who are on this platform today. Thank you, fantastic. That's very, uh, that's very good, sir. Thank you so much for opening the, those doors. Um, I've got a hand raised from engineer Didi Olufalobi. Please unmute yourself and ask your question, sir. Engineer Didi Olufalobi, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, madam, and thank you, uh, our distinguished lecturer. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the foundation for being consistent on doing a good job. Um, you cited the example of Coast River State, um, how they were able to put together the uh, chocolate and the cocoa processing plant. Uh, given the number of barriers into industrialization in Nigeria, cost of finance, power, and all that, what's your disposition to uh, industrialization being driven? by governments. Uh, and uh, if you are positively, this is a two-part question inclined. What do you think needs to be put in place to ensure that um, the, the, the bias against government driving industrialization, the issues that might arise out of it are taken care of? Thank you, sir. Now, um, these are questions that I would have felt so comfortable answering when I was in government, but I'm not, no longer in government and can do nothing about it. I can, I can talk to government, I have access to government uh, by having been there, but I am not in government anymore. So that makes it a bit more difficult. We did have an industrial uh, uh, plan called the NR, NIRP, the Industrial Revolution Plan. And we still have it today. It's all about, about implementation and it sets out the role, what government can do, should do, and what the private sector should be focused on. The government has a primary responsibility for creating the environment in terms of policies, uh, supporting policies, and also making sure that infrastructure, one of the things you identified is electricity, and making sure that you have electricity uh, to address, uh, to bring down your cost of production. 
Um, and the government should be able to do that. Now, it, state governments should take that industrial regulation plan and bring it down to their state level and say, what can the, if federal government is not doing certain things, what are the state governments doing? The state governments should also do it, uh, look at what they're able to do. And if they're not able to do it, then it goes down to the community. And what are the community, what, what, are, what, are, what are my seeing communities do? Uh, they are creating investment, uh, industrial parks, if you like, where there's captive uh, energy, electricity there, much, much cheaper, and where there are shared facilities amongst those people that are using that industrial park. That is what China, Saudi Arabia, all these other countries, that's what they have used to develop their industrial base. Although much, much bigger than what we have in Nigeria, the problem has been some focus enough to devote enough money to provide the enabling business environment. So the minimum you need from government is policy. The second is infrastructure development. And I did hear the deputy governor of Oshun State talk about what Oshun State is doing about infrastructural development. Uh, and I think if there are industrial zones in different parts, let's say in Elisha, for example, there's, you can work with the state government to put all the things there. Or if it's viable, investors can come in and put money there. The industrial the zones that are effective in the country are in zones that have been built by the private sector. So when you talk about the free trade zone in on the effects, and uh, yeah, on there, it's, it's privately private sector owned, or Snake Island and all the others, they are owned by private by the private sector. Anybody can apply and, and they can get once you can demonstrate that you're able to do what you need to do. But I think for the purpose of our discussion, it's something where you should look at an industrial zone already in, in Elisha. Yes, no. If there is, how can we get the state government, first of all, to put something to it and get it done? How can we support the state government to get it done and uh, have a, a common facilities for our uh, entrepreneurs? Thank you, sir. Um, actually, this is not a question. I think it's, um, it's, a que it's for the foundation. And it says, I am an indigene of Elisha West based in Kano and into cattle ranching and dairy. Is there any enabling support from the foundation to help land use? Um, so that's a question for the foundation. I'm not sure if Mr. Olisha Gaganga can answer that because I'm not sure if you're a member of the foundation. I doubt it. The other um, statement here is for diasporians who are really interested in coming home, how can they be assisted? I don't know if that's a question you can answer for us, sir. Well, it depends on what you mean by uh, assistance. Um, it depends on what you mean by assistance. For me, um, so, so I, I need that individual to be more specific about what they mean by assistance. Okay, he's got his hand up. I would call on him. Uh, yes. but I'm going to call uh, um, Mr. Jimmy Morgan. I apologize. I'm going to call on Mr. Wale Belu now because it's his question that we're asking first. So, Mr. Wale Belo, please unmute yourself and ask you, clarify your question, please. Wale okay. Belu. Yes, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, Minister, thank you for your time. And um, it's a nice one that we have. So basically what I'm trying to do here is people in diaspora from experience, you know, this issue of insecurity when you come around is very, very... Um, you know, it's, it's scary, you know, coming from the contact. That's number one. I mean, you have to take it into account uh, your, your, I mean, your safety. Now, I know that people in Nigeria, to an extent, they are safe, but you seem to be a target when you come home. You, you know, there's a way, there's a way you are, you just, you know, become a target, and you might not be able to afford your own personal security. That is number one. Number two, okay, so you have some fund that you think you have been able to save. You know, you want to come around. Um, getting a loan to add to whatever you think you have in savings um, is always a, a problem, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I like agriculture. You know, I like to go into agriculture and some of the things you mentioned, you mentioned. 
no. you, 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 to a certain extent, you need some level of connection in Nigeria to make this happen. So probably my question is, the links you need, you have, you have the wherewithal to an extent, you have the drive, but the level of frustration that you would, you will be faced with if you don't have the, the, the access can be very um, terrible. So that's my question. Okay. Um, you said a lot of things that um, I do hear and I've had several times. I, I was, I traveled with the president around 68 different countries when I was an industrial and trade minister. So I listen and hear, speak to diaspora and uh, I live in the United Kingdom as well. So I, I'm one of you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I understand what you're saying. Now, going back to the point, um, I think it's, uh, don't, it, you, you, of course, you've read a lot about things in the social media and the press and everything. I'm not saying there's no insecurity, but sometimes when we read too much of these things, we're scared, they, it scares us uh, beyond different parts of it. You have family members who are based in the country and they will be there. They, they, it's, they, it's not a case that they are protected and you are not protected. You know, nobody sees you and, and, and says, this one is diaspora, let us go after him. Unless you start fronting your Stalin and pounds and whatever it is, nobody sees the difference. So I think the first thing is to have um, reliable people you know in the country. They may be family members, and they may not be family members, but there are mostly one or two or three people you know and you can vouch for. It's important that you have a trusting relationship with one or two people in the country because they can guide and support and assist you. Now, once you, that is far more important and, and those people will have access to information and people. Uh, People say you need connection all the time to make things happen, but it's not necessarily correct that you need connections all the time. Anywhere in the world, connection is important. Let's first of all say that. We may say this, it's more important than Nigeria, but anywhere in the world, connections, you know, we play on relationships. Relationships, networking, all those things are important. However, I think what is more lacking in our society is that we don't have enough available information in the public space. Therefore, you don't, if, if I tell you the agencies you need to speak to or talk to, you may not even know who to speak to when you, when you go into it. So it's not having information. And that's why I recommend people like the, the uh, Swedam, the uh, Bank of Industry and all that. If you have your business plan and the business is viable, viable and you have money you're putting into it, I can assure you that if you present a good plan to Bank of Industry, for example, uh, you, you have a, a good chance of getting that loan. So it depends on who you go. If you go to the commercial bank, it's different. And the rate is going to be very different. And okay. the security and all that required will be very different. Uh, but for the development banks, uh, you may be able to get some support and assistance. And what BOI and the others have done is that they have what we call business advisors also, who they actually ask to help them evaluate and assess those loans, applications and businesses uh, before they look at them. But they have a process in place. Uh, you may or may not be aware that BOI, for example, is, uh, now is actually rated. And because it's rated, it means that it has processes in place that the credit agency uh, is comfortable with. And it's based on their rating that they have been able to go outside and get to raise money to support businesses in the country. So I think it's all about, first of all, having one or two people you know and trust and having reliable information, access people where you can go to for reliable information. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Jamie Morgan, you can now unmute yourself and ask your question, sir. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, let me start by um, thanking uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Ulusha Gumwaganga. He, you listed a number of intervention areas, and I think the fourth one was finance, and you challenged us, and the seed fund has now been set up. 
which you have uh, very kindly uh, launched. Um, but one area of concern that I have has to do with the engagement of human capital. Uh, that's critical also to the development process. Um, growing up in Lagos, there was this concept of Jesha abroad. And there are so many distinguished Ijesha sons and daughters who are outside of Ijesha land. We are not really engaged enough with the homeland. That's true. Now, uh, with your yeah. experience, um, I know I can mention maybe the Ondo, the Jebu, and so on. Hold on, I'm uh, on that. Be a different approach. Let me call uh, you and back. Then, or something. And then also, uh, I was privileged once to um, go with uh, a couple of ministries uh, to uh, China, and uh, we looked at the development parks. And they actually actively uh, reached out to Chinese in the diaspora. So for instance, they got two Chinese who came in from Sydney to come and launch, um, and to come and set up in the industrial park because they are coming with technology and management practices. So what advice, what's your comment on that? And what advice would you have for uh, Jesha sons and daughters? Thank you very much. I think you've made a very, very important point there. Um, very, very important point. The, the thing is that we are stronger together than as individuals. And you'll be amazed as at the quality of information and resources you have out there that you are not harnessing together to make that difference. What I'm hoping and I was hoping with what I have said today is that through the setting up of this fund, for example, it will make those people more engaged and make everybody, so it should be, thank God, uh, this is one of the positive things about uh, COVID-19, we're able to connect wherever we are, whether you're in Lagos, London, I don't, you, you know, Saudi Arabia, there are people on this call, or. or this platform today from different parts of the world is a lot easier to connect now. And I think when you, you it's important that you connect with the EJSHAS. And that's why I was saying prominent sons and daughters at home and abroad. When you bring the ones in the diaspora, with the ones in Nigeria and all that, you'll be amazed at the, the team you form together and how the reach and ability of each one to reach and make a difference. And I think you will see that this may involve into actually having a more a plan, an economic plan, and know exactly what you want to do and how to get the resources. So I agree with Mr. Jimmy Morgan, who um, I, uh, is a good friend. He didn't disclose it, but let me disclose it. Uh, it's a good friend. And he's he one of the business advisors to uh, Bank of Industry. He has a lot of knowledge and experience. and. I am hoping that he will put his one million down also in the next week or two, and that will make him even far more committed. But I can assure you that this could be the beginning of the change you want to see in the Yusha land. I, I agree with him, and I think we can get it done. Okay, so I've still got a few hands up, but we've got six minutes to go. So for everybody that hasn't um, asked a question, I'm limiting you to a minute. I've got God's daughter's iPad, but you haven't put your name there, so I'm not going to call you until you change your name. Mr. Uh, Fulusha Okumadiwa, please, can you ask your question? Uh, thank, thank you very much. I will uh, keep to your one to the one minute slot, and I also quickly appreciate the uh, resource person, Dr. Fulusha Guaganga, and of course thank my brothers on the foundation for regularly bringing us together to ruminate about how to develop Ijesha land, particularly from the perspective of entrepreneurship. What, what, what i like to ask Dr. Aganga to speak briefly on is, you see, you, you mentioned gold as one of the things that is beginning to emerge as a change for Ijesha land, business-wise, economy-wise. And it becomes important that we become proactive as a group in the context of that. We probably has missed the chain in terms of uh, Shagilola taking the first lead on this, which is great. And we have a team that is working on that. But there are definitely value chains along the line that are also supportive 
activities along the lines that we can take opportunities of and build entrepreneurship and small scale groups around that. Would you want to really help us uh, describe that a little bit? Because one of the issues, and I'm sorry about it, one of the issues we have, there are many young uh, people roaming around that can really be brought into the fold of entrepreneurship. And that's why I like this seed fund that you are talking about. But they need to be retooled. Their awareness needs to be changed and their vocational skills needs to be built, but in particular area. So what are the opportunities that you see for us as digital people that we can begin to tap into to prepare young entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs around this emerging sector of the gold mine? Thank you. Before you answer, sir, can I just ask the remaining two to ask their questions because of time? I'm very conscious of time, so that it might be that you might be able to answer all the questions together. So, Temitoka Abraham Ajay, can you ask your question, please? All right. Uh, good afternoon, the organizer of this program and uh, our honorable presenter for this day. My question is basically to the organizer of this program. Uh, the Speaker of today has spoken in length about the efficiency of industrialization and I'm entrepreneurship. Sorry, I'm sorry to interject, sir. If the question is for the foundation, can we keep that to one side and uh, just address questions to the speaker only at this point because of time? So uh, possibly, questions... possibly it should be in a better position to also oh, respond to the it's question. Because you said it was for the foundation. That's why I interjected. Thank All you. right. Yeah. Uh, because uh, when Pastor Adeboye was speaking the other time, within the first one minute that he spoke, he spoke about education and detail for Dr. Aganga. So we are, when we are looking at entrepreneurship as a business entity, we have what you call educational industry. There are several potentials in the Jesha land, both tap and on top. But incidentally, one of the burning areas that has not been really tapped in Ejechaland is the establishment of a university. Although we have a satellite campus in the Petu Ejecha, there is no way entrepreneurship can grow without us having the traffic of people. Although Ejechaland is strategically located in Oshun State as well as in Nigeria, but we need the traffic of people in that as is. And one of the areas through which we can increase the traffic of people is the establishment of university. So I want to confirm from Dr. Aganga, as well as the organizer of this program, what are those things that you feel we can do to attract this industry to Ijechalan, at least one? Thank you. Okay, so can you answer, um, Mr. Olusha Gwaganga, can you please answer the two questions? Every other question, can you please put that in the chat? And it's something we may have to deal with later because we're, time is against us right now. Thank you. This will be the last question for today. All other questions to the chat, please. Please unmute yourself, sir. You're not unmuted, sir. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, Professor Folusha Oguma Dewa. You may, I, I think we worked closely briefly when I was in Ministry of Finance. Do you remember? That's, that, that's true, sir. I work with the World Bank. Yes, I know. I know you. you, you I know a long time ago, but you were in my office a few times then when I was Minister of Finance. Right. Okay. Right. Now, um, can we talk about your, your point about the education, you're talking about university, uh, setting up university. I agree with you entirely. Education itself is an industry. And in fact, um, it was one of the industries or one of the sectors that created some of the, most of the jobs we had at a particular time when I was in government. So uh, people do not know this, but education itself is an industry. And, and there are many ways people can get going to it. Uh, so I agree with you. People will look, to look into this uh, in terms of the education industry. Uh, in terms of the major one about university, there are only two ways you can have university established. One is by the government or by private. So prominent agency or someone 
can decide that I want to set up a university in, in, in Malaysia and apply, and it will go through the process and they get uh, um, the application granted and they may set up their university. And the other one is uh, through the federal government deciding to locate a university. So those, those, are, that's, those are things that need to be done. So I'm sure there may be other people already looking at it as a, an industry itself, but uh, that's the private sector through investments, um, as in a, as a private university or as a government university. On the Segilola, uh, uh, sorry, on gold itself, I did mention, I, I said I was not going to go uh, too deeply into it because I said the Egyptian Mineral Resources Development Forum. I don't know them, but I did read some, they had done an extensive work itself, uh, engaging with Segilola and others, uh, trying to see what needs to be done. And I think the smart thing to do now is not to make the same mistake we made with oil, which solid minerals, meaning that we should not, it shouldn't be a case of, uh, we just get someone to explore, take the oil and take it away. And then we buy back the petroleum products and all that. I think that uh, even though for the, for the gold to actually uh, have the right commercial value, the Sungan value, it's important that, uh, Within the industry, there are certain uh, gold processing uh, countries and farms that are regulated that must have some uh, certification, and that gives value to the gold itself. And that's why, to some extent, London is seen as one of the preferred places, London, Switzerland, of where to take your raw gold to. Um, some people take it to the Middle East, but because of regulatory and legal uh, provisions there, um, it, it doesn't attract as much value when you take your gold to the Middle East, as opposed to when you come to places like London and Switzerland. So there are some uh, technical things on the processing, but that doesn't stop you from doing part of that processing locally. In Nigeria today, there are two uh, semi or small processing plants in the country today. Uh, none in Indonesia, both of them are in the North. Uh, there's no reason why they cannot be set up locally. There's no reason why um, you cannot train your people to, pick up, to, do, to go into artisanal mining. And what the federal government has provided, there's a, an agency now uh, that is acting, that, that's helping to aggregate gold pro, uh, produced by the artisanal miners, helping them to make sure that they get the right value and price rate and helping them to market it out. So they aggregate it uh, for them locally. We just started that uh, in, in, in Nigeria now. There's no reason why the, you cannot do the same thing in, in Jishalan. Now, given that in the part and the metals, again, because of lack of regulation, adequate attention, uh, the, uh, in the past, people that actually benefited from this artisanal mining were not Nigerians, so Chinese that came into the country and were doing all this taking advantage of, uh, of, of what we had locally. Uh, but today, I think that has been sorted out. And I think that uh, some of them do not have the adequate tools, equipment to do what they need to do. By providing them with training, the tools that they require, you can promote artisanal mining very, very easily and the assets, uh, gold, can be aggregated very easily and sold uh, for great value for them. So there are many things, but I think there should be a plan to look at it and say, what's the whole value chain here? Where can we plug in and what do we need to do? And how do we need to equip and train people to get into those sectors? Thank you very much, sir. And um, at this point, I'm just going to have to apologize to everybody else who had a question to ask. I've posted the email address I-F-F-E-A-L-D, ifield, at gmail.com. Please, you can send any more questions to that email address, and we would endeavor to um, respond to you. Also, the bank details have been posted in the chat. Please, you can take the details down. And that's ifield, Wema Bank, Elisha, account number 0122-951-736. And thank you very much for everybody that has participated in the question and answer session.
And now I'm going to call on Dr. Ido Oshibode to give us the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all established protocols observed. Our eminent speaker, distinguished ladies and gentlemen from all over the world. My name is Idowo Oshibodu Niyomole, and I'm the Secretary Board of Trustees of Ijeshaland Foundation for Entrepreneurial and Leadership Development. I hope you've all enjoyed this highly informative, enlightening and thought-provoking webinar. It's my honor and privilege to give a vote of thanks to all those who have helped to make this event a success. I, on behalf of the foundation, say a big thank you to our speaker, Mr. Shegwaganga, C-O-N, for taking time out, to, in, uh, time out of his very busy schedule to deliver this lecture. Thank you, sir. Something that really struck me was uh, your discussion and definition of social entrepreneurship, which in essence, the success of it is not defined by profit alone, but to have, a, 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 to make an improvement, a development and benefit for the, communi for the community as a whole. And this webinar has been about encouraging our generation and the younger ones to develop that entrepreneurial spirit our forefathers in Nigerialand and our nation Nigeria are known for. So it's really good to keep this in mind. Thank you very much, sir, for, for enlightening us. And I really thank you as well for launching the seed fund and for your generous donation. We really appreciate it. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to His Excellency, the Governor of Oshun State, Mr. Adeboyega, Oyetola, his deputy, Mr. Olubwe Galabi, and His Royal Highness, the Owa Obokun of Ijeshaland, or by Dr. Arumolaro, and our father in the Lord, Pastor Adeboye, for their prayers and messages of goodwill. I thank you, our MC, Ms. Um, Moke Olushope, for moderating the event excellently. Thank you very much. And I wish to express my gratitude to all the dignitaries who have taken time out to support this event. Time, of course, will not allow me to mention names. And you all know that we appreciate all of you. This event would not have been a success. It is without the effort and commitment of the members of the foundation. Thank you for all the hard work you've put into organizing it. And I thank everyone who has joined out join us on the various platforms. We're not just on Zoom today, we've been on Zoom, we've been on Facebook and on Instagram. And I thank you because without you all, it would have been a non-event. But last but not the least, I thank the almighty God for making it possible for us to all be here today. Thank you. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity and I wish you all a very enjoyable weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ma. And at this point in time, can we all bow our heads in prayer as Alaji Latif Bakari leads us in the closing prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity given us to observe and assault the event. We thank Almighty God for preserving us and as we shall be moving on each day to give us the great will and the enablement to be able to carry through all of the all of the recommendations and the ideas given by our erudite uh, speaker dr olushegun aganga and as we shall be moving on towards uh, the activities we will be carrying out. We beseech you to be with us and grant us uh, journey messages for those who will be traveling and the financial enablement to be able to lead through the development of Cheshire land. We beseech thee to give us the, the, the spirit of cooperation, the various forum, the various foundations and the various organs of development of Cheshire land 
that we can all work statistically for the benefit of Ijesha land and for the, to the glory of Almighty God. Almighty God, please hear our prayers. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. And that ends today's webinar. I hope you all found it very enjoyable, informative. I'm sure we have all done that. And God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, the governor of, of the executive governor of Oshun State, Mr. Adibwega Oyutala, and his uh, speech will be delivered on his behalf by the deputy governor of Oshun State, Mr. Adibwega Alabi. Can you please roll the tape? Thank you.
indicator of critical area of agriculture, tourism, and mining. I'm happy to say that Jisha Land is indeed potentially positioned to lead this economic revolution. All the phenomenal entrepreneurship spirit imbued in the Jisha people that has made you world-class entrepreneurs and innovators. I am expected that through this lecture, we will be enlightened and further challenged on the need to follow the full step of the enterprising exports of our four peers and rise as change agents in our quest for the transformational development of our land. I thank you and wish you a most fruitful celebration. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And now, the goodwill message from Pastor E. A. Ajaboye, General Overseer, RCCG Worldwide. Please roll the table. Thank you. Beloved elders of Egyptian land, greetings to you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to thank God for your life. I want to thank God that you are following your strength of your ancestors. I'm sure you know these elders like you that brought about the establishment of the Lisha Grammar School by Alma Mater. I want to thank God that they started something that had produced great men and women all over the world. I want to thank God that you too you have started something that I believe is going to bring a lot of blessings to several people throughout the whole world. Thank you very much. And thank you for honoring me by asking me Say a word of prayer for you and for Jesha Land as a whole. My prayer for you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that it will be well with you, that the desire of your hearts will be granted you, that the God I serve will take care of you, take care of your families. Take care of all those who are precious to you. My prayer for you is that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you will not fail. You will not fall. But you will never beg for bread. My prayer for you is that it will be well with you all the days of your life. That the Almighty God will move you from glory to glory, from greatness to greatness. My prayer for you is that your evening will be far, far more glorious than your morning. My prayer for you is that your children will be greater than you. That every member of your family will be celebrated sooner or later. My prayer for Egyptian land is that the glory of this great land will be fully restored. That the almighty God himself who look down with mercy on the Jesuit land and prosper this kingdom far, far beyond our widest imaginations. My prayer is that every plant God has not planted in the Jesuit land shall be rooted up. My prayer is that whatever prayers we we'll pray for Jesuit land, God will answer by fire. My prayer is that very soon the whole world will be hearing beautiful news of miracle signs and wonders concerning Egyptian life. And so shall it be. My prayer is that the Almighty God, who started revival in Egyptian land in the days of, of Alola, that same God will start another great revival in Egyptian land so that very soon the whole land will be shouting God is good. God is kind. And Jesus.
Jesus' name. So shall it be. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. Once again, thank you very much. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And now, for the moment we've all been waiting for, the lecture itself, I'd like to introduce to you, Mr. Shtego Aganga is a chartered accountant with professional career extending over four decades, holding a number of leadership positions in private and public sector. His wealth of experience covers a broad range of sectors, including investment banking, investment advisory, traditional and alternative asset management, insurance, oil and gas, manufacturing, services, and construction. He is the chairman, Marina Express Trade Services, 3V Partners, and he sits on a number of boards, including Lidway Penshaw PFA. He is also on the advisory board of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust in the United Kingdom. Mr. Aganda was previously a managing director of Goldman Sachs in London, and prior to that, he was a senior director at Ernst and Young, London, where he had various roles, including responsibility for some Japanese clients and the subject matter expert for hedge funds in Europe. Within the public sector, he served first as Nigeria's Minister of Finance and Chairman of the Economic Management Team, and then as its Minister of Industry, Trade and Investments. Mr. Aganga has been wildly acclaimed as being responsible for many transformational milestones in Nigeria, including establishing the country's sovereign wealth fund, issuing the nation's first euro bond, chairing the World Bank and IMF in 2010, chairing the 8th Ministerial Conference of the World Trade Organization, MC8, in Geneva in 2011 the first African to chair this organization, making Nigeria the premier destination for investments in Africa and launching the country's boldest industrialization agenda. He was also responsible for structuring and financing the first standard gauge rail in Nigeria. Mr. Aganga remains one of the most regarded investor influencers for Nigeria based on his extensive experience both internationally and in Nigeria, and his track record in and out of government. In recognition of these contributions, he was awarded the commander of the Order of the Niger, CON, one of the highest ranking national honors by the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He founded the Nigerian Leadership Initiative, NLI, a platform for accomplished and credible Nigerians in the diaspora and in Nigeria to sharpen their values-based leadership skills and to play a role in transforming the country. Mr. Aganga is a chartered accountant with degrees from Oxford University and the University of Ibadan. He is married with four children. And now, uh, Thank you very much, the Chairman, Your Excellencies, Your Royal Highness, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please permit me to adopt the protocol already established. I would like to thank the Judicial Land Foundation for Entrepreneurial and Leadership Development for inviting me to speak at this year's Dr. Lawrence Omoli's CON annual lecture. This particular lecture is dedicated to Pastor E.A. Adeboye, the General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of Nigeria worldwide. The invite brought back memories of my time at Price School and the journey from Lagos to Adoikize and back at the beginning and end of each term in the late 60s and early 70s. 
we would stop at leisure to refuel, relax, and eat. I remember that as we drove through Elisha in those days, it was difficult not to notice those big houses. At least that was what they looked like to us at the time. Those big houses of some of the most, of some of the highly successful Egyptian entrepreneurs, like the Omoles, Ajanakus, Onis, and so forth. In a way, this motivated the younger generation to aspire and hope that one day they too could become as successful as some of these entrepreneurs. I also grew up in Bodilon Road, Ikwe, Lagos. And most people who know the Queen's Drive. Anytime I strolled down to Queen's Drive, it wasn't possible not to notice a very large, wide, imposing building known as Ijisha Lodge, owned by Chief Esme Bakari, another Ijisha successful entrepreneur. There are many, many more, but the message is clear that like most Nigerians, entrepreneurship is in the DNA of the average Egyptian man. That is one of the reasons the topic for today's lecture was chosen. Today, I intend to address four main areas. What is entrepreneurship? How and why it is a tool for development? and the catalytic role you and foundations like the IFFEALD can play to achieve this development and social value to our communities. It was Lee Kuan Yew, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, who said that one of the reasons for his remarkable success in Singapore was that he was always, he would always put pragmatism before ideology or theory. In the same vein, I intend to belong on pragmatism, practical things, and very short on theory, and on the academic side. It is about focusing on an outcome and that create and add values. So what is entrepreneurship? There are many definitions of entrepreneurship, but for the purpose of today's discussions, it is better understood by describing it in many ways. Generally, entrepreneurs are involved in four main businesses. Small businesses, scalable startups, large companies, and in social enterprises. Sometimes they are classified broadly as traditional and social entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurship is a new and growing phenomenon and will be relevant to our discussion today. I would therefore like to expand a little bit on social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship is at the most basic level doing business in a social cause, or doing business for a social cause. It might also be referred as a altruistic entrepreneurship. They don't measure their success in terms of profit alone. Success to social entrepreneurs means that they have improved their communities and the world, however they define it. Social entrepreneurship focuses on gaining understanding of how a social problem develops in the communities and how an entrepreneur, with the use of his innovative practical ideas and business strategies, develops solutions to solve the problem.
to the benefit of the society as a whole. Social entrepreneurs focus at utilizing the various available resources to create a better and progressive society. Making money is not enough for them. They need to add meaningful value to the world and to their communities. Many philanthropists and investors looking for economic and social return have raised a lot of funds globally to support social enterprise. The Queen's Commonwealth Trust is one of these organizations focused on funding, connecting, and supporting social entrepreneurs in the Commonwealth. I sit on the advisory board, and I was so delighted to see that entrepreneurs in Nigeria, Ghana, Trinidad and Tobago, Mozambique, Uganda, Rwanda, Malawi, Tanzania, Kenya have benefited from the Queen's Commonwealth Trust. Both traditional and social entrepreneurs have a number of attributes in common, which some refer to their characteristics. They have passion for their venture, are hardworking and very flexible. They have the ability to spot opportunities and do something about those opportunities. What some may call the unique attribute to smell money from afar. They are like the Dangotes and the Boas of Nigeria. It is one thing to spot an, op an opportunity, but what differentiates them is that they do not only spot the opportunities, but they do something about it. In a way, they are plotters, shapers, and implementers. They have a determination to succeed and are always optimistic. And like the average Geisha man and woman, they are not easily deterred by challenges and believe that they, and they believe that they can, they can and will always find a way. You definitely need this to succeed in Nigeria. They understand the use and the value of money and are set. Medal of Freedom and the Congressional Gold Medal in 2010. There is absolutely nothing stopping prominent Ijeja sons and daughters to set up a mini microcredit fund to support the, the poor, the women, to create sustainable businesses. Just imagine the impact this could have in the community. Another well-known social entrepreneur is Mark Koska, who redesigned medical tools and introducing a non-usable, reusable, inexpensive syringe to be used in underfunded clinics. This innovation safeguards against the transmission of blood-borne diseases. Koska founded the Safe Point Trust in 2006 which delivered 4 billion safe injections in 40 countries via these auto disabled syringes. And of course, we have the case of Joel McNamara, who founded a company when she was still in high school, 
mainly it's an e-commerce business that creates jobs for African women by selling the products they make. Products range from jewelry to wooden kitchen utensils. Another lesser known and small company makes and sells t-shirts with positive non-violent messages to the people in the community where there was need for values reorientation. There are some, these are some of the ways traditional and social entrepreneurs act as drivers of development in their communities and in their nation. But why is it so important that we act now? It is far more important now than ever before that we use entrepreneurship as a tool for community and national development due to a combination of factors. One is a high level of poverty in our country today. According to the 2019 Poverty and Inequality Report released by the National Bureau of Statistics recently, 82.9 million, representing 40.1% of Nigerians, are poor. The Poverty Work Clock actually claims that the number of the absolute poor in Nigeria is closer to 105 million which is about 51% of the population of our great country. There's a high level, there's also a high level of unemployment, which has been made worse by COVID-19. The high level of social unrest and insecurity. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, Nigeria is one of the countries that will be worst hit by food crisis, and we are already seeing the signs. According again to a survey released last week by the NDS, one in four households was already indebted prior to the pandemic, and the share of households experienced insecurity remained high at 68% as of the end of August 2020. And according to the World Bank, the collapse in the oil prices coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic is expected to plunge the Nigerian economy in the 1980s. The federal government of Nigeria is already taking steps to address some of these issues. And the different state governments are already taking steps to address some of these issues through the Economic Sustainability Plan. And we're beginning to see some results, but we cannot leave it alone to the government. 